I am so honored to be able to introduce to you our special speaker for Celebrate Freedom Sunday this year. Cal Thomas is one of the most well-known, well-respected uh, journalists in America. With a twice-weekly column appearing in hundreds of newspapers, Cal Thomas is one of the most widely read and one of the most highly regarded voices on the American political scene today. He's also a veteran of TV and radio news and commentary. He's authored many, many books, uh, all of which I highly recommend. By the way, he's brought a few of those books with him today, and they'll be available after this service is over for your purchase. But church, one of the things I, one of the many things I admire about Cal Thomas is that he's able, he has an ability to view the entire political landscape in our country through a biblical lens. He, does, he has a way of not allowing partisan politics to get in the way of what is right. And I admire you greatly for that. Uh, he has four children, 11 grandchildren. He and his wife, CJ, live in South Florida. Let's give a warm Redeemer welcome to Cal Thomas. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pastor. Boy, I love that choir and orchestra. Fantastic. What a, what a blessing you have every week. I want to thank uh, the pastor for relinquishing his uh, pulpit this morning which I regard as another example of standards falling everywhere, but, you know. <laughs> hey, I'm from Washington, D.C. If you can fake humility, you can fake anything. <laughs> I wanna talk about the two kingdoms a little bit today. I love this country. I wouldn't have been born in any other if I had a choice. We are so fortunate. But you know, on the uh, July 3rd, uh, 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was finally approved and published on the next day. Benjamin Franklin walked outside of Independence Hall on a very hot summer day in Philadelphia and was met by a woman who asked him a question. Mr. Franklin, what have you given us? And his reply was, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And every generation since then has been challenged through all sorts of things the Civil War, slavery, uh, Vietnam War, depression, downturns, challenges from within and from without. But we have been able to maintain it for nearly 250 years. However, as Ronald Reagan famously said, we are only one generation away from losing it all. This is not the normal state of humanity in the world. If you look around the world, you see political oppression, denial of women's rights, lack of freedom of the press and association, dictatorships. We are an oasis in a desert of intolerance and dictatorship and censorship. And we had better see that we pass along to the next generation, which has been given to us by some of those we honored today through military service. Because if we don't, we will lose it, and having lost it, it's very difficult to get it back again. So if you didn't flunk table of contents in physics like I did, <laughs> you may be familiar with Isaac Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Every effect is rooted in a cause. For example, if you drop out of school early, the effect is likely a poor job, low income, and a problematic future. If you exceed the speed limit, the effect might be that you will be stopped by police and given a ticket. And if you've received Christ as Savior, the effect is eternal life. And if you ignore, even rebel, against scriptural truth, you might see the effect of what we're seeing in our nation today. Riots in the streets after the Supreme Court acknowledged that Roe versus Wade was poorly decided and returned the issue to the states. Not to mention the corrosive effect on all of life that 63 million dead babies has produced. 
daily shootings in major cities and in schools. These things happen when nations forget God and are no longer under his authority. He gives us over, writes Paul, in one of the most frightening verses in scripture. On the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, our 30th president, Calvin Coolidge, my great uncle by marriage, by the way, that's where the cow comes from. Yeah, it's better than being related to Franklin Pierce. <laughs> Address the American Society of Newspaper Editors in Washington. Here's part of what he said, and this is so profound. You know, Coolidge didn't talk a lot. He was known as Silent Cal. He had a reception once at the White House, and a woman came up to him and said, Mr. President, I have a bet with a friend of mine that I can get you to say more than two words. And Coolidge replied, you lose. <laughs> but when he said something, it was worth listening to. And here's what he said on that 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. It was not because it was proposed to establish a new nation, but because it was proposed to establish a new nation on new principles that July 4th, 1776 has become regarded as one of the greatest days in history. Great ideas do not burst upon the world unannounced. They are reached by a gradual development over a length of time, usually proportionate to their importance. This is especially true of the principles laid down in the Declaration. Three very definite propositions were set out in its preamble regarding the nature of mankind and therefore of government. These were the doctrine that all men are created equal, that they're endowed with certain inalienable rights, and that therefore the source of the just powers of government must be derived from the consent of the government, of the governed. Now I digress for a second here because in the next paragraph of the Declaration, after this endowed by our Creator, Thomas Jefferson wrote, and to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Why is that necessary for government to do? Because as James Madison observed, if men were angels, we would not need government. Human beings, because we are sinners, must be controlled by a power higher than ourselves, either from without, by the government acting under God, otherwise it becomes a dictatorship, or within by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Coolidge continued the link between the declaration to something far deeper than the great minds who created it. Quote, no one can examine this record and escape the conclusion that in the great outline of its principles, the declaration was the result of the religious teachings of the preceding period. The profound philosophy which Jonathan Edwards applied to theology, the popular preaching of George Whitefield had aroused the thought and stirred the people of the colonies in preparation for this great event. But when we come to a contemplation of the immediate conception of the principles of human relationship which went into the Declaration of Independence, we are not required to extend our search beyond our own shores. They are found in the texts, the sermons, and the writings of the early colonial clergy who were earnestly undertaking to instruct their congregations in the great mystery of how to live. A spring will cease to flow if its source be dried up. A tree will wither if its roots be destroyed. In its main features, the Declaration of Independence is a great spiritual document. It is a declaration not of material, but of spiritual conceptions. Equality, liberty, proper, prop, popular sovereignty, the rights of man, these are not elements which we can see and touch. They are ideals. They have their source and their roots in the religious convictions. They belong to the unseen world. Now listen, as Charles Stanley would say, unless the faith of the American people in these religious convictions is to endure, the principles of our declaration will perish. We cannot continue to enjoy the result if we neglect and abandon the cause. I would suggest to you today, and you see it in the news every night on television or read in your newspapers, that we are neglect neglecting and abandoning the cause. We are seeing the nation we love torn apart by violence and the promotion of things God calls an abomination. We invent ways of doing evil, writes Paul, and the effects are increasingly observable. 
economic effects, political effects, spiritual effects. But then what would you expect the end times to look like? We are witnessing two kingdoms moving in opposite directions, one heavenly and one of the earth, destined for destruction and to be replaced by what John the Apostle saw in Revelation, a new heaven and a new earth. In a recent survey, young Americans were asked about their faith. 20% said none, 20%. Easy divorce, shacking up, the consequences of what we once called broken homes, political correctness, uncontrolled immigration without assimilation, the loss of a shared moral sense. These and much more are tearing our fabric as a nation apart. Out of many, one is becoming out of one, many. I write about them in my latest book, America's Expiration Date, The Fall of Empires, Superpowers, and the Future of the United States. We should be reminded of this verse in Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Does this not describe our culture today? The late Catholic Bishop Fulton J. Sheen remarked, America, it is said, is suffering from intolerance. It is not. It is suffering from tolerance. Tolerance of right and wrong, truth and error, virtue and evil, Christ and chaos. Our country is not nearly so overrun with the bigoted as it is overrun with the broad-minded. And this, freedom does not mean that right to do whatever we please, but rather to do as we ought. The right to do whatever we please reduces freedom to a physical power and forgets that freedom is a moral power. But what if we abandon the standard of what is right and wrong? What then? The late columnist Joseph Sobrand said, I would rather belong to a church that is 500 years behind the times and sublimely indifferent to change than I would to a church that is five minutes behind the times, huffing and puffing to catch up. I love that. John writes that anyone who wants to be a friend of the world cannot be a friend of God. Sadly, too many churches are huffing and puffing to catch up with the world. Today, freedom has become license and truth is subjective. You have your truth, I have my truth, and even if they conflict, it's okay, as long as you feel good about yourselves. <laughs> Ted Koppel, the former anchor at ABC Nightline, once said, truth is not a polite tap on the shoulder. Truth is a howling reproach. I always like that. But what is truth? All of this is forecast in scripture, starting with the ancient prophets. Jesus himself told us what the end times would look like. Paul wrote about the nature of man that precludes him from doing anything that is righteous in God's sight. John was given a vision of the future on the Isle of Patmos. Their vision of the future is looking remarkably like our present. As a journalist for over half a century, please tell me I don't look that old, <laughs> I've witnessed at close hand, through my years in Washington, man's attempt to improve himself. Every election cycle is the same. It doesn't matter the party. Elect us, and we're gonna be more moral than those other guys. Elect us, and we're gonna make the country a better place, really. If they could, wouldn't they have by now? Political leadership is not what we need, although we could use some good political leadership. Our basic problem is not who's in Washington, it's what is in our hearts. It's sin. Now, nobody's a sinner anymore. Uh, if you do something bad, uh, I don't know if you're applauding sin or just the theology. <laughs> uh, you know, if you do something bad, it's not your fault. It's uh, your mother loved your sister better than you. You didn't get the dog you wanted when you were four. You were born on the wrong side of the tracks. The usual stuff. But sin explains everything. Everything. So speaking of the ancient prophets, here's what Isaiah, or if you're from Wales, Isaiah, said about nations. Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They're regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. Isaiah 40, 15 to 18. I do not see America as an exception. 
I do agree with the psalmist who wrote, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Are we being reproached because of our rebellion against God? Is he giving us over? Near the start of the Civil War, in 1863, the Congress asked our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, to write a declaration of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Having tried everything else, nothing seemed to be working. And Mr. Lincoln, without a speech writing staff, without uh, the Gallup poll, wrote these words, which are so profound, they echo down through the corridors of history to our day and provide the only solution there is for our corporate problems. He said, it is the duty, a word that has fallen out of fashion, it is the duty of nations as well as of men to owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God and to confess this truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. We have been preserved these many years. <laughs> Credit to Mr. Lincoln. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the hand that graciously preserved us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the need of redeeming grace, too proud to pray to the God who made us. It behooves us then, he said, to humble ourselves before the offended power and to pray for national clemency and forgiveness. Do you know a better way? I do not. I know a typical July 4th observance in churches is supposed to quote the founders and subsequent leaders who spoke of the divine and even quoted scripture. We hear that a lot in our day, politicians in both parties quote scripture and, ap and apply the words of God to earthly agendas. After the 2016 presidential election, a prominent evangelist said, God showed up. I wondered who showed up at all the other elections. <laughs> Just saying. If you believe, as Paul writes, that all authority is from God, then and we ought to be praying for those who are in authority over us and ask God why he put them there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <clears throat> so let me apply the words of Jesus to a heavenly agenda. As he stood before Pontius Pilate, Pilate asked Jesus if he was a king. And Jesus replied, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. John 18, 36. That's hard to argue against. That's pretty definitive. My kingdom is not of this world. What are we in 2022 or any time to make of this? We like to yes but scripture in order to justify our earthly agendas. Should we be placing our faith in flawed earthly leaders to deliver what can only be given by God? I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for those in authority, which we are commanded to do, but it is a matter of priorities. I'll tell you a little story. I've had the privilege of being in the presence of or meeting every president since John Kennedy. Yes, I was a kid. <laughs> Several years ago when Barack Obama was president, I was at a dinner in Washington called the Gridiron Dinner. It's a thing where all kinds of famous and fancy people show up. Jeff Bezos was there. Uh, who else? Uh, Ken Burns of PBS. Many other high rollers, white tie, you know, ball gowns for the women or those identifying as women. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, my syndicate was sponsoring the dinner that night and so our table was right up near the dais. President's up there on the other side of the lectern. So Clarence Page, my fellow columnist, uh, was the host that evening. I said, Clarence, come here a minute. He said, what? I said, um, President Obama is the only president I have not met since Kennedy. Uh, would you ask him to come over? Now, that takes a lot of chutzpah, don't you think? So Clarence does. President comes over. I got a great picture of the two of us. Wonderful smile on his face. I said, Mr. President, I want you to know that our congregation prays for you every Sunday. He said, well, thank, thank the congregation. 
I said, there's something else I want to tell you. He said, what's that? Expecting criticism. I said, God has placed you where you are for his purposes. And he said, I believe that. Thank you. And that was it. Now, what would you have said? Don't even think about it. <laughs> so, when he was king over Israel, David said, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. That's the NIV translation of Psalm 146.3. The New Living Version is even more direct. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. That's pretty definitive too, isn't it? Now, if America is to endure, and there is no guarantee in scripture that we, or Russia, or China, or Iran, or Venezuela, or Cuba, or any other nation will endure, because Jesus is coming back to set all things right, but if we are to endure between now and then, it appears to me that the only thing that will save us is a revival. Let me tell you about the greatest revival ever to strike this country. The year was 1857, and the Congress, clearly under different management, uh, asked uh, the president to uh, issue a uh, declaration, and he did, and, and this is what happened. Two men got together on Wall Street to pray once a week for revival in America. They met in the little Dutch consistory building in uh, southern Manhattan. It was, that little building was not destroyed on September 11, 2001, when the Twin Towers right next to it came down. Rather miraculous. And then they decided to start meeting every day on their lunch hour because the situation was so dire, they felt in the country. We were almost at civil war in 1857. And then the room was too small to meet all the men who wanted to pray, so they decided to move their little prayer meeting to the churches and ask their wives to join them. It wasn't long before a revival broke out. At the height of it, 10,000 people a week were being converted in New York City. When the revival moved down the Appalachian Mountains and reached West Virginia in the middle of winter, uh, people cut holes in the ice to baptize the new converts, prompting one commentator to say, when Baptists do that, you know they're on fire. <laughs> when the revival jumped the Atlantic and hit the coal mines in Wales, there was a work slowdown, and somebody asked, how could there be a work slowdown with a revival? And the response was, so many miners were converted, they stopped using bad language, and the horses couldn't understand what was being said to them. <laughs> in London, crime almost disappeared. There were so many people converted to Christ. The police were asked, what do you do now since there's virtually no crime, no drunkenness? So, well, we form quartets and go sing at the revival meetings. <laughs> J. Edward Orr writes about this in his book, The History of Revivals in America. But do you see the order of things? It's not from the top down. It's from the bottom up. It's not from the outside in, it's from the inside out. And this is the way God glorifies himself. So if we are seeking a revival to improve the stock market, to make us feel good about the political positions we hold or the people we voted for or against, it's not gonna happen. But if we humble ourselves before God, and pray that he would be honored once again, or as the Old Testament says in so many occasions, so everyone will know that there is a God, the God, the only one, then perhaps he will respond. I would love to live long enough to see a real revival in America. It is a miracle of God. It cannot be done by a pastor. It cannot be done by technology. It can't be done by direct mail. It can't be done by any other way Paul writes in Romans 8 that God has built futility into his creation in hope that the creation will turn to him. Now, I'm old enough to have seen it all. I've seen the promises of members of both parties. I've heard all of their claims. I've seen their programs. It isn't working, folks, because it's not addressing the real problem, which is internal, not external. We better get that straight. So as mentioned before, Paul writes about our sinful nature in Romans 1. This is quite an indictment. It's worth reading and rereading so we keep our priorities in order and do not engage in what some have called Christian nationalism, fusing the kingdom of God with the kingdom of this world. Here's what he writes. You're probably familiar with it. It's very sobering. 
the wrath of God. Oh, but God is love. Yeah, but there's another side of the coin. The, gra- the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Wicked people suppress the truth. Have you noticed? Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. There's that word again. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. My wife and I go through the one-year Bible every day, you know, the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm and Proverbs. How many times the word fools and foolish are used? I had a, um, I used to do Crossfire, sat in for Pat Buchanan on CNN years ago. We had the then head of the American Atheists on around Christmas time. And he was arguing for the removing of major scenes from uh, you know, public property. And I said to him, why are you always messing with my holidays? I don't mess with yours on April 1st. <laughs> Works every time. Although they claimed to be wise, Paul writes, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Does this sound like current events? Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become with ev- filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. The current ways are not enough. We have to invent new ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Folks, this is current event stuff. This isn't just 2,000 years ago. This is today. Now, why would anyone put their faith in such sinful people? Yes, vote for people who best represent your beliefs, of course. But don't expect them to be able to do more than God can or that you should. The late First Lady Barbara Bush had the best line I've ever heard on this. She thanked me once for keeping the line alive. She said, um, your success, our success as a nation, your success as a family, depends less on what happens in the White House and more on what happens in your house. If politicians could solve problems, would they not have solved them by now? And yet, like members of a cult, too many people, including too many believers, sad to say, Continue to behave like that scene from Peanuts where Lucy promises to hold the football for Charlie Brown to kick, but always pulls it away at the last second. Poor Charlie Brown still believes this time she would really hold it, despite all of the evidence to the contrary. C.S. Lewis said something to the effect that if you're unhappy with your life on earth, perhaps it's because you were made for another place, a better place. The late chairman of Tiffany's, Walter Hoving, created a sterling silver pin in the 1970s that people wore on their lapels. Some of you may remember it. It simply said, try God. Those of us of a certain age have seen everything else tried and it's not working. A rational person might want to try God. One of my favorite hymns, 
contains where I put my faith. It's called the solid rock. You're familiar with it, I'm sure. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the dearest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground, Republican ground, Democrat ground, independent ground, mushy middle ground, no opinion ground, all other ground is sinking sand. Remember that. Yes, vote early and vote often, but remember that. All right. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for confirming the truth of your word. I ask that it be confirmed in every heart here this morning. We thank you for being the ultimate ruler and authority who puts up nations and puts them down, who raises presidents and kings and deposes them. We don't know entirely why, but we don't have to because we trust in your character. You cannot lie. You have made a home for us in heaven, our ultimate home. Jesus said he went to prepare a place for us and we look forward to that day. Thank you for the truth of your word. We pray that you would send a revival to our country that you might be glorified again. And we ask this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this video on First Redeemer's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, click like below and leave us a comment. And if you'd like more content like this, click subscribe and turn on your notifications. Thanks again for watching.